Ever since the age of four, he says, John Fogarty wanted to write top 40 songs. In 1959, he joined his brother Tom's band, The Blue Velvets, and, as always seems the case with blossoming bands, this one, renamed The Gollywogs and soon to become renamed again, partly incorporating a friend's first name and a beer ad line to make Credence Clearwater Revival, had some rough spots when they started out. And their rough spots didn't stop. In spite of the massive success of the group, they struggled with internal conflict and angst from the very beginning, apparently fueled by John Fogarty's relentless pursuit of his vision for the band. Nevertheless, Creedence Clearwater Revival and John Fogarty carved a niche in music of the late 60s and early 70s. And now, probably known only to hardcore Creedence Clearwater Revival fans are 10 things that you didn't know about the band and their first top 10 single, Proud Mary. Number 10. It all started with a song title. John Fogarty wanted to write songs, but had low confidence about his ability to do it. To get started, he purchased a small notepad and labeled the first page as song titles. He then began jotting down titles as he thought of them, the first one being Proud Mary, but had no real concept of what it would mean. The idea of making the main character a boat came later when the mental images of his discharge from the National Guard, the small jobs he held in his youth, and various other memories began to gel into a song about a riverboat. Number 9. It was a real boat. As it happens, there really was a boat that was nicknamed the Proud Mary. Accounts about the type of craft and the dates of service vary, but the following, which I'll paraphrase, came from Steamboats.com via JimmyOgle.com. The Proud Mary was more formally known as the Mary Elizabeth and was a repurposed prisoner transport turned towboat based in Memphis, Tennessee. The name Mary Elizabeth was not the original, though. The steam-powered craft was built in 1905 and first named the Sarah A. Jenks. She was screw-driven, not sternwheel, as one might expect, and was used to transport prisoners from the New York City jails to the Sing Sing State Prison. After two subsequent owners and conversion to diesel engines and changes of duty, she ended up as a ferry, commercial utility vessel, and finally a towboat on the Mississippi River. You could have seen her in use along the Mississippi performing a myriad of duties besides towing between 1928 and 1978. Number 8. John used a different tuning than Tom. To get a fatter sound next to Tom's guitar in standard tuning playing in the key of D, John tuned his guitar one step down and played the song one step higher as if it was in E instead of D. This is what produced the rich low end of the guitar parts on the recording. The tuning also affected the sound of the solo break and the lead guitar fills during the song, a detail that defies duplication unless you play the lead guitar tuned down to D relative. It befuddled garage bands for years. Number seven. No one in the band had ever been to the South. At the time of the Proud Mary session, no one in the San Francisco-based band had ever been to the Mississippi or anywhere outside of California, for that matter. The bio, the Mississippi, and other Southern references were manufactured from John's own mental images surrounding the theme of the song and led to the perception that the band was from the South. Number six. John did all the vocals on Proud Mary, including lead and background. John had the idea of using gospel-like harmonies, and early takes of the background vocals being sung by the band didn't sound right to him, so he overdubbed all of the background harmonies himself. This turned out to be a point of disharmony among the band members, though, 
and became a catalyst for further disgruntlement during other tracks as they made more albums. Number five. John's singing style was developed because of bad PA systems. The early venues that the band played were responsible for providing the PA systems, resulting in frequent situations of inadequate or even non-existent equipment. Consequently, anyone singing, which usually was John Fogarty, had to belt out the lyrics at a near yell to be heard. The style became a habit. It was enough of an issue that when they were on the road between mid-1969 and 1972, they brought along their own custom 400 PA system, assuring a superior vocal sound quality. But the cost of transporting the equipment made touring a money-losing deal for the band, and they had to abandon the idea. Number four. CCR never had a number one song in the U.S., Proud Mary was the first of five singles by Credence that went to number two on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Note that it went to number two. In spite of their massive success, they never had a number one record in the U.S. None of the top five hits ever topped out on the Billboard Hot 100 higher than number two. Consequently, CCR has the dubious title of producing the most number two songs without ever having a number one in the U.S. To be fair, though, Proud Mary did make a number one in a few other countries, Austria, South Africa, and Yugoslavia. Number three. They played at Woodstock, but refused to be in the movie. According to John, he wasn't happy with the sound of the band and refused to have the band's performance released as part of the original Woodstock documentary film. Bassist Stu Cook later said that not being in the movie was a huge mistake by John and that the band, then one of the very top acts in rock, most certainly should have been in the Woodstock movie. Well, finally, the performance clip was included in the 40th Anniversary Expanded Edition box set of Woodstock, so it's not lost forever. Stu also said that the venue was a lot tougher on the audience members than the acts on stage, although it still was a tough performance venue. Number two. The line was, Pumped a lot of pain. The second line in the second verse still throws many folks Pumped a lot of pain down in New Orleans. According to John Fogarty, the reference is to propane, as he worked at one time in a service station pumping gas. He used pain as a poetic shorthand for the fuel he pumped for the cars, regardless of the fact that cars don't run on propane. He used it mainly because he thought that the lyric sounded cool. And now, number one. The opening chord progression was inspired by Beethoven. Fogarty liked Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in C minor and borrowed the conceptual use of two chords as an opening with different emphasis on the first chord instead of the last. Such use of classical music as a basis for pop tunes is not at all unheard of. Perhaps one of the most familiar might be Barry Manilow's use of a section of Chopin's Prelude in C minor for his composition, Could It Be Magic? But there were quite a few others. Fogarty came up with the famous chord riff on guitar by experimenting with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in C minor, and, with the exception of the cadence, the two-chord intro is very similar to the one that Beethoven used. Proud Mary and the entire Credence Clearwater Revival song catalog continues to be popular even to today. New guitar players, in particular, enjoy the simplicity of John Fogarty's chord designs and usually find the song comparatively easy to play compared to some other ones that were popular at the time. And if one was in a garage band in 1969, it was another one of those songs that you could almost guarantee would be requested.
Hey, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please click on that like button, won't you? And leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. If you're not yet a subscriber, this would be a great time to subscribe to the channel. And if you are already a subscriber, this is a great time to consider upgrading your subscription to channel member status and enjoy channel member perks like being the first to see new videos days before anyone in the general public sees them. Thanks again for watching.